All right, it's almost 9.30. Uh, who has questions? Oh, shit. That's a good question. I don't know. Hang on. Hold on. Let me spy on what's coming up today. <laughs> Not that you guys wouldn't know because you have it too. Um, let's see. Oh, I don't know. What's a good one? Um, how about puke? <laughs> Make it puke. I'll try to work that in today. Puke. <laughs> Who doesn't love puke? Oh my God, we need mood lighting for today because it is Valentine's Day. Mm -hmm. Keep your hands to yourselves, people. <laughs> All right, so we ended up on Tuesday or whatever day that was <clears throat> talking about keystone species, right? That last slide about a keystone species is some organism in the community or the ecosystem that if you remove it, let's say it goes extinct, we kill it off, we trap them all and make them leave, the entire ecosystem can change. Okay, that would be considered a keystone species. So our book uses the example of a bee as a keystone species is in an ecosystem because the bees are in charge of pollination, right? And so they pollinate the flowers and the trees and all that crap. And what we're going to talk about a little bit more today is all animals on this planet are dependent in some part on plants. Right, because plants are the only things on this planet that can harvest energy from the sun, right, and turn it into sugar, something that's usable energy for us. A usable carbon energy source, right, ultimately comes from the sun and is converted by plants into sugar in their matter. And all animals either eat plants or eat an animal that ate plants or eat an animal that ate an animal that ate an animal that ate a plant. Okay, so on some level, all organisms are dependent on plants. So if plants stop reproducing themselves or pollinating, and in order to get a seed or a fruit, you generally need pollination as well. So food sources, if it's a, uh, something that, like our picture is the flowers, right, or the berries, um, seeds, all the other organisms are dependent on the plants, which are dependent on the bees to make all this food happen for everybody else. So if all the bees are removed from an ecosystem, the whole thing will collapse. Okay? And so that's the idea of a keystone species. Whereas if we pull out one bird species, it might change things a little bit, but a bird that just eats seeds is not going to cause the entire ecosystem to change. Okay? If the bird was like... Uh, a high predator like a hawk and that and the hawk population kept the rodent population under control and we killed all the hawks and then the rodents overpopulated and wiped out all the vegetation and then nobody the rabbits don't have anything to eat and blah 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 then that you could consider that bird a keystone species okay it just depends on where they fall sort of in the food chain and how much they affect everything else The Africanized bees, the killer bees. Yeah, so most, now most honeybees in the United States have been Africanized, right? They have bred with the African killer bees because most of the, our honeybees are European anyways. They're not Native Americans, okay? The Native American bees are the big bumbly bees, right? Those big ones that are enormous. You can't believe they actually fly and they kind of bump into stuff, okay? So the honeybees that make the, that those are all from Europe, right? They do ha right now have a problem with a parasitic wasp and some other viruses that are infecting the, um, 
beehives. And so at one point, the Africanized bees were brought over to help hybrid vigor, but they're much more aggressive. Yeah, so um, if, so if our European bees all died and the African bees take over, if they provide the same role in the ecosystem as the one they took over, then we would consider now that one's the keystone species, right? So if you lose something, but something immediately takes its place, which is entirely possible, right? If that was the main pollinator and they sort of had a corner on that market, and then when they disappear, somebody else can move in to take over, then yeah, the ecosystem may not collapse, right? We'd still consider that role the pollinator, the main pollinator, the keystone role, right? But yeah, exactly. Something else could step into its place, and then we don't see a collapse in the ecosystem. So for questions about keystone species, I'll give you examples of how they act in the environment. Like, I won't expect you to know that elephants are a keystone species, right? I'll give you a scenario of some stupid organism, and then everything else dies, and then it turns into a desert or something dramatic. And then you'll say, oh, it was a keystone species. OK, so blah, blah, blah. This just gives you the idea of all the things that um, we need bees for, right? So if you go drive up to San Francisco and you're on the five, right, and you're driving by all the farms, you will see giant stacks of beehives out there just for pollination, right? Just to make sure all the almond trees are pollinated, all the fruit trees and all that stuff up there. Okay, so, because we essentially rely on those for all the pollination. Okay, so the keystone species stuff brings us into the food chain. The idea of a food chain is who eats whom. Okay, my example of, you know, an animal that ate an animal that ate an animal that ate an animal that ate a plant is essentially a food chain. Okay, where do, where do we fall on a food chain? Well, we're omnivores which means we eat everything, <laughs> right? So we eat plants and we eat animals. And so we could fall in lots of different areas of the food chain depending on what we're eating. So I'm going to give you some examples about in nature, and then we can talk about uh, what, where you think you might fall most of the time, okay? So the base of the food chain, the very bottom that we all rely on, like I was talking about, are the plants. Those are the producers of all the usable chemical energy on this planet. Okay? We think of them as plants. It really is anything that does photosynthesis. Okay? And as it turns out, algae does photosynthesis. It's green. It's not really a plant. Okay? It's a single-celled organism. But there's a whole shitload of algae on this planet, and they actually do, do lots of photosynthesis. But for our examples, um, we'll mostly talk about plants being the producers, okay? They call them autotrophs. Troph just means eat, essentially. Auto means self, so self-feeding, right? Plants don't have to go find food. They just make it themselves. And then they're so nice as to share it with us, okay? So they produce their own sugars, Right, then make their complex uh, carbohydrates and other complex molecules from that. Right? What they absorb through soil is not sugar or other organic compounds. What they absorb through the soil is really just water and minerals. Okay? Everything else they pretty much make themselves. Right? They make all their protein, they make all their sugars, they make all their lipids, all their fats all that themselves. So they are truly autotrophs. They make all their own food, and then they supply it to the rest of the food chain. Okay? So the producer, the one that makes the food, that produces the food. So that one should be easy to remember. Right? Anything that does photosynthesis is a producer. That's always the bottom of the food chain okay? for our purposes. And then a consumer right, is anything, we think of a consumer as people who buy stuff. But a consumer, you consume it, consume vast quantities, right, is when you eat stuff. So we'd call that heterotrophic, other feeders, right? We feed on other stuff. We eat the producers or we eat other consumers that eat producers and 
you know, we can, we'll list a little hierarchy of how that works. Okay, so a consumer is one that does the eating of the producer, is the guy that makes, essentially makes the sugar, makes the energy. Okay, and so here's their li our book's little picture of a food chain, or I guess it's more like a pyramid. Okay, and we have a blueberry bush on the bottom. It is a producer. In this case, uh, it's, y you can either consider it the fruit or the seeds or the leaves, whatever that little mouse is eating. They call him a, an herbivore because he eats plants, herbs, okay, a herbivore, herbivore, whatever. Uh, and then the hawk eats the mouse, right? So the hawk is a carnivore, eats meat eats the mouse that eats the blueberries or the seeds or whatever on that plant, okay? And this picture also shows us the feeding relationship between all the different organisms. So the mouse, when it's eating the plants, right, it's going to get only about 10% of the energy from the plants that the plant took in from the sun. Okay, so if we could quantify how much energy that plant actually took in from the sun, right, what it gives away to the mouse is about 10%, okay? Because the plant essentially has to use the other 90% to survive, to live and reproduce, right? So they're just not making unlimited amounts of sugar and just giving it all away, right? An easier example is when you go from the mouse to the hawk, right? If the mouse chows down on a whole bunch of plant, 100% of that plant matter is not, does not stay in that mouse, and then when the hawk eats it, gets all of that. Because the mouse has to live, right, and run around, he's using energy, making heat, right, pooping, right? As it turns out, you don't, everything you eat doesn't, isn't absorbed like, right, you poop out a whole bunch of it. No, you guys don't poop? Oh my goodness. I need some Benefiber. Okay, so only about 10% of the energy at each level is transferred to the next level, okay? So you lose a whole lot of energy. The books all want to say it's all lost as heat. Well, the byproduct of doing everything is heat. Right? If you run around, you get sweaty. That's because you're hot, right? You're losing heat as you're burning energy. Just like burning in a fire makes heat. Like the energy you physically combust in your cells provides heat as well. So it's not efficient. It's only about 10% efficient at every level. We lose 90% of what was taken in from the sun. So the farther we eat from the plant matter, the more loss of this energy there is, okay? So an example of that is it's much more efficient for people in a nation that is starving for food and doesn't make a lot of, doesn't grow a lot of crops, has limited ability for agriculture to eat the plants directly, right? It's much better to eat the corn on the cob directly from the plant than to feed that corn to a cow, have it shitting out 90% of that energy you grew in the corn, and then eat that cow, right? The amount of food it took to feed one cow that then feeds, you know, however many people, you could feed almost 90 more people if you just ate the grain, okay? That's all that this is sort of saying. Not to say that we should all be vegetarians, I mean, that's more efficient as far as, you know, the energy from the sun. But in, a pla in places where food is at a limit and agricultural space is limited, it makes more sense to feed people directly from the grain than to pass it through a cow first. Because you lose 90% passing it through that cow. Okay. That's okay. Okay, but cows are really yummy, so hello. Okay, so you could think of our sort of trophic level, or your eating level, your feeding level. Producers are always on the bottom, or they're always the ones that somebody's feeding off of, per se. Okay, a primary consumer, primary means first, 
The first consumer eats the producer. Okay, so that would be the stupid little mouse. And the secondary consumer eats the primary consumer. That would be the hawk. If you had a tertiary consumer, right, that would be the wolf that ate the hawk, that ate the mouse, that ate the blueberry. And then you could go, the, then people eat the wolf that eats, I don't know, people don't eat wolves. But let's say you're really hungry and you need to eat a wolf, right, you'd be the, you'd be the fourth level, eats the wolf, that ate the hawk, that ate the mouse, that ate the blueberry. Okay, so those are going to be the cheesy questions on the exam for that. You know, the hawk ate a rabbit that ate a piece of grass. The hawk is the what secondary consumer? The rabbit's the primary consumer. The grass is the producer. Okay, like that kind of stuff. I'll tell you who's eating whom to get there. The last one that kind of fits, not really in the chain anywhere, but it's definitely a very important part of the ecosystem are the decomposers. They eat the detritus matter. Detritus just means dead crap stuff. Okay? And so they eat everybody after they're dead. So that would be like the funguses, right? And the bacteria and those guys. Some parasitic worms. Okay? And so those guys don't really fit in our food chain, right? They'll eat uh, the producer, once it's dead, right, a tree falls in the forest and it doesn't make a noise because nobody's there to hear it. And then the fungus will grow on it, break down the wood, right, extract the cellulose and carbon molecules from the wood, right, that's decomposing. Anything that's rotting is decomposing, right? A dead animal that's rotting is full of fungus and bacteria and worms and maggots and gross stuff. Those are the decomposers. So you could be any, you could be a producer, primary consumer, secondary, blah, blah. If you're dead, the decomposers are going to try to eat you. Okay. So let's just watch a little video clip about that, shall we? I think we shall. Oops. Let's do that so it's easier to see. This one's a little dark. These custard apple fruit have fallen to the ground, and bacteria and fungi rot the sugary flesh within just a few days. After a tree removes as much protein and nutrients as possible from its leaves, it sheds them. Unseen bacteria and fungi then decompose the cellulose of the leaf cell walls. The released nutrients are used to support the growth of the decomposers, which eventually die and leave those nutrients to the next consumer. Yellow slime molds feed on the bacterial and fungal decomposers by streaming over the surface of decaying matter on the forest floor and engulfing anything small enough to be taken up. The bulk of these mushrooms is underground or embedded in wood, degrading cellulose and taking up the released sugars. Oh my God, that's so awesome. Okay. So then here's just another little example, right? We have, what do we have? I don't know, that hawk, bird, falcon, whatever, eating that other bird, eating the caterpillar guy that's eating the plant. No, oh, we can't go to my book here. And then you could think about it the same way in any kind of system if you're looking at uh, an aquatic system, right? There we have our shark guy. He's eating a fish that's eating the, like, krill stuff, which is eating plant, like, algae-type crap, which is the producer, okay? Just a stupid chain of who eats whom. Mm -hmm. What I just said, see, yes. And if you think about it, Going back to that other slide, at every level, it's only about 10% efficient of what the original energy that was created, not created, which was captured by the plant from the sun, right? Because energy is neither created nor destroyed. It is only changed in form until the sun dies, and then, yeah, we're done. No more energy for us. <laughs> See, I just said that. <laughs> I must be psychic. 
All right. Remember, these are all online, so I'm going kind of fast because we have all kinds of interesting video clips to watch today. Okay. And so this is the same idea of that loss of energy from level to level. Here we have the grass, right? Here's our deer, and then there's our wolf. So from what the grass converts from the sun to what it actually can give up to the deer is only about 10% of what it takes up because it needs to use the rest to survive and reproduce and do all its deal, right? And then same with the deer, right? It's all lost as heat when it's doing stuff as poop uh, and, you know, just living its normal life for the wolf to take. So then whoever's eating the wolf even gets, you know, 0.1% of what was originally found down here. It's just the loss of energy through the, the eating levels. So only about 10% is passed from each level. <sighs> ah, and as it turns out, as you know, as we've been talking about, every species out there doesn't only eat one thing. Right? So especially like human beings, we're omnivores. We don't just eat, one, we don't just eat a cow. We're not always just a secondary consumer. Right? We might be a primary consumer. We might have a salad, mm, some broccoli, potetra, I don't know. Uh, we might eat, I don't know, what else do we eat? <laughs> a pig, right? What if the pig ate, pigs are omnivores too, right? They'll eat chicken. So what if you fed chicken to a pig and then we ate the pig? Right? We'd be a tertiary consumer that ate the pig, that ate the chicken, that ate the seeds or corn or whatever the hell chickens eat. Yeah? So th that's a great question. She said, what, can't we also be decomposers because we eat dead stuff? So that's a great question. There's, they like to, to differentiate the decomposer from like the scavenger. Right? So a decomposer is technically sort of dissolving the dead stuff, right? Like that slime mold, it kind of exudes some enzymes and it makes it gooey and then it absorbs the sugars and that's how bacteria kind of exude enzymes out and then absorb little parts in, right? So that's technically a decomposer. If we're eating stuff that's dead, we'd be more considered a scavenger, right? Which would fall into one of the consumers. So let's say you're driving along Right? And you see a deer that got hit by a car on the side of the road, and you go scoop it up and put it in your trunk. You're like, venison, yes. Right? You're a scavenger. You're not decomposing it, because, unless you like, spit all over it and try to dissolve it and then eat it. So, you know, do you see the difference? That's a great question. Right? So just, just eating dead stuff doesn't make you a decomposer. It does make you a scavenger. Right? So like, there are like vultures, that's all they do. They don't ever catch anything alive. They go find roadkill and eat it, or you know, half of a carcass that a hyena ripped up. Right? So they're still a consumer because they're eating it like we think about eating, not dissolving it or being slimy and gross like that. That's great. Does that make sense? You guys are with me? <laughs> oh, Lord. Okay. So then here's the idea of what we think might really happen out there. You can find a chain amongst the web, right, to look at how individual, especially predators that are up high on the food chain, what they might eat. But it's all interrelated, right? We might eat, the owl might eat a bird that ate a blueberry, or it might eat, you know, a, something, a rodent that ate an insect, so there are small little uh, mouse-like guys called a shrew, and they actually eat insects, they don't eat plants, they look pretty much just like a mouse, so if they ate an insect that ate plant matter, they would be the secondary, and then the bird that ate them would be the tertiary, and then the owl would be the fourth level, all right? So you can, you know, mix, mix it all up, okay? So it's all, you can find a chain in the web, but most of the time, that's not just one guy, the only thing it eats is this, the only thing it eats is that, the only thing that eats is that. It's usually much more complicated. Yeah. Okay. 
now we're going to talk about some interactions amongst all of these guys. And you can think about, because I know you will, whether they're a primary consumer, producer, as we're doing this stuff, right? Because I know you guys are studying, yes? Yes, yes. Not waiting till the night before. Studying the night before is a disaster. Do not do the experiment. It's been done too many times. All right, so we're going to talk about competition, predation, and parasitism first, and maybe some other stuff. I don't even know what's coming up. Uh, what first, uh, our book wants us to talk a little bit about um, an ecological niche, which is really just where an organism lives and all the things it does and how it, it acts in its little environment. Okay, so like the niche of a keystone species is sort of keeping that whole ecosystem intact. So as long as different species have their own niche and they don't overlap at all, we'd have no competition between different species. We'd only have our competition within a species, right, which leads to natural selection because the guys that aren't good at competing die and they don't pass on their stuff. And that's all there'd be. But as it turns out, not every organism on this planet has its own little niche. It only eats one thing. It doesn't have to compete with any other organisms. And we could see that by the stupid food web, right? Lots of different animals eat a species of bird, not just one, right? So those two different species, a falcon and a hawk, are both competing for that same, you know, pigeon resource, okay? So that's when we get competition, okay? Competition usually limits the size of the populations because there's not enough food for everybody. Again, if there's unlimited resources, there's no competition. Everybody eats, even if you stink at catching food because, you know, a rabbit just bumped into you and, oh, I could eat that. Okay. And it may either cause extinction, make one leave, right, or really damage both populations. If they're both really good at getting food, then they're just going to, then the competition is going to limit both of their populations. Okay. So this is just an example of the different types of niches there might be, right? Depending on um, colors, uh, hummingbirds either prefer specific colors and specific shapes of flowers than honeybe honeybees that are different than what moths do. All of these are pollinators, right? All of them depend on the nectar or the sugar from these plants. So flowers, um, remember flowers are what have all the genitalia, mm, the girl parts and the boy parts of a plant. And then when the moth lands on it, his little feet are tickling all the parts and picking up the pollen and then sticking it on another flower's boy part, uh, girl parts and picking up more pollen and then the boy and the girl, right? Their little feet. Um, I don't even know what I'm talking about now. Uh, <laughs> And so the flowers have evolved over time to be more attractive to the pollinators because the ones that are most attractive get the most tickling, make the most seeds, leave the most offspring, get the most tickling, leave the most seeds, get the most offspring, and so on and so on. So flowers will get brighter colored, and uh, these guys are after actually the sugar that the flowers make. So they actually make liquid sugar right in those flowers that the moths drink, the bees drink, and the hummingbirds drink. So the more sugar and the sugarier the flowers make, the more likely they're to attract the pollinators, right? Those are going to survive to reproduce, blah, blah, blah. And that's how we get this huge array of all different flowers and shapes and so forth. The whole co-evolution like we saw in that video. Okay, so each one sort of is trying to make a niche so they don't compete too much. But bees still will go to the ones that are mostly for hummingbirds and vice versa. So there is some competition, especially if resources become scarce. When there's a nice huge field of flowers, there's not so much competition. If, let's say, it doesn't rain that much that spring and the flowers are kind of crappy, there aren't too many, there's going to be much more competition. Okay. So there's two different types of competition. One is called exploitative. And the other one is called interference. Interference is the one that we think of as regular competition, 
Okay? When you're both, both parties are there and they're punching each other out to get at the resource. Right? Like two little kids fighting over a lollipop. There's one lollipop, there's two kids. Whoever punches the hardest gets the lollipop. Okay? The other really good example of interference that I like to use that you guys will remember is when, when my daughter was a baby, she used to puke. Yeah. <laughs> I knew you guys loved puke. Yeah. Okay. All the time. Like, like just projectile vomit. Right? So anytime you fed her, she would just, just projectile vomit. We had a dog and two cats. As it turns out, they really liked that. So, you know, you're walking the baby, burping, you know, right, over your shoulder, and then all of a sudden you hear splat, because it shot up over your shoulder. And then the dog and the cats just run in there, and they're fighting it out to get at the puke. Woo! Okay, that's interference competition, right? Whoever's the most aggressive gets to have the yummy, right? Disgusting, yeah. So, <laughs> so that's a great question. So let's see. Yeah, so that's great. So the formula that the baby eats is most well is probably mostly milk-based, which is from a cow, which would be a primary. So baby's going to be secondary. Dog would be tertiary consumer. See, look at that. Could be a question on the exam. <laughs> but, the, well, that's a good question. The, there, oh yeah, I don't know. I'll have to ask one of my experts in ecology if eating the barf <laughs> really counts. It would, so, right, that's a great question. So, the amount of energy left in. How, it depends on how much came out, right? So our question is, how mu you're not going to lose that, ten, that 90% in that trophic level, right? So I guess then I'd have to weigh it. How much did the baby drink, like eight ounces, and how much got barfed back out? Because that would sort of be like a direct, it only kind of sat around. You didn't lose much. Ah, very good thinking. I don't know. We'll have to do some experiments. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. Okay, so exploitative competition is a, is a little harder. Uh, it's not so bad. It's, it's relatively easy to understand, but it's not the typical kind we think about. Exploitative is when two different species are in competition for the same food source, but not at the same time. Okay, so the example of that is something that both that little kangaroo rat eats and the harvester ant eats. Kangaroo rats only come out at night. They sleep all day. So they come out and look for the little seeds or whatever the hell those guys eat. Really cute, too. And during, at nighttime, so they get as much as they can at night and then they go to bed. Okay, and, during, and the ants are sleeping all night. And during the day, the ants come out and go after that same food source. Okay. So they're both competing for the same food source, but they're not physically interacting. Right? They're not fighting. They're not, they don't see each other, and the rat doesn't try to stomp on the ants to get more of the food. Right? They don't ever see each other, but they're in competition for that same food source. So if there's lots more kangaroo rats that are really good at and they find all the seeds in this area at night, then there's nothing left for the ants. This population will decline or vice versa, right? So a huge increase in the ant population may cause a decrease in the kangaroo rat population. They're in competition for that food source, but not directly. Right? They're not interfering with the other's ability to find it as far as physically. They're just removing it from the environment at a different time, okay? Uh, interference competition is also can be considered like territorial, right? Fighting for a territory. It doesn't have to just be fighting for food. Remember when we talked about uh, being able to survive and reproduce, you need to have water, food, some place to live, some place to uh, have your babies, right? 
or direct competition, right? Like the, these guys just bash their heads together. Oh, and whoever's not passed out gets to mate with all the females. So they're in competition for mating. So there's lots of different types of competition. Let's watch this guy. Vampire bats use their forearms, long thumbs, and feet to walk, hop, and fight. The fight is short, the intruder quickly repelled. <laughs> the victor has retained his territorial rights. Well, he's not messing around. Okay, so <coughs> that's competition. The next type of interaction that we want to talk about would be predation, and I think all of us sort of have a general idea of what a predator is, right? Technically, a predator is anything that eats and kills something else, right? Uh, usually another species, okay? So, and then the prey would be the one that gets eaten or killed, okay? So predator-prey relationships Right, one organism eats the other and kills it. So actually being a primary consumer is considered predation, okay, because you're actually eating the plant. So that seems kind of silly, but according to these, you know, science folk, they consider eating plants to be predation. So the predation of a cow on a grass field, whatever, okay. But usually you actually kill, in this case you don't always kill the plants, but you definitely damage it a lot, right? Unless you eat the whole thing. Okay, and so then here's another example. So this would be, in this case, uh, the Canadian lynx pretty much only eats a snowshoe hare. So it doesn't have a lot of other prey that it, that it goes after. And when we talked about last time how the predator prey cycle together, this is another example where that would happen. When there's lots of snowshoe hares, the Canadian lynx has more food, they can have more babies, their population goes up, they eat more rabbits, that population goes down, and then the predators starve because there aren't enough rabbits, and then the rabbits go up, and so it's that cyclical predator-prey relationship. And they can follow this forever and ever, and it's easiest to follow when the predator is a specialist, right? Just really eats one thing. Because if it ate all kinds of small rodents, then you wouldn't see it cycling with just one species. So it would have to cycle with all the species. But as it turns out, there's a lot of snow in Canada in the winter. And most of the rodents are hiding either way deep be below the snow or hibernating, except for the rabbit who has to come out and eat all winter. And so that's the main prey for the Canadian lynx. Just a little Canadian tip there. Okay, so if predation can get rid of a species, wouldn't that eliminate the predators? Yeah, in some cases it might, especially if the predator is a specialist, right? Only eats the rabbit. If there was some horrible disease that came through and killed all those rabbits, most of the Canadian lynx are gonna die over that winter because they have nothing else to eat, okay? So yeah, that could, there's a much more danger of a specialist predator of going extinct because it's absolutely dependent on one other species. Remove that one species and they're screwed. But since they are a specialist, they're really good at catching that one species, right? Rabbits, when they run, they have a, a huge ability to maneuver, right? Going, dong, 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 dong. Right. Whereas most predators running fast can run in a straight line pretty fast, but they can't do that maneuvering, right? So to catch rabbits, you have to be pretty good at maneuvering. You don't have to be super fast, you know, running balls out. Whereas if you're chasing after an antelope, you have to be able to just run balls out like a cheetah, okay? So if you specialize in one type of prey, you get really good at catching that one prey rather than being kind of good at catching a lot of stuff. So there's an advantage to being a specialist for that, but the disadvantage is if your prey species has issues, then you've got serious issues too. Okay, whereas a generalist can eat a whole bunch of prey, but if you're eating rabbits, 
and mice and shrews and squirrels. You have to have a whole lot of different skills catching all those different things, right? They each do different things to escape predators. So you're never going to be awesome at one of those unless you specialize, okay? Oh, there's some more videos. This species notes. preys only on the larvae of social insects. And here they attack a nest of paper wasps. In the face of such an onslaught, there is nothing the wasps can do. They abandon their brood to the voracious horde, which will soon strip the nest of all life. That's so dramatic. Who feels sorry for those wasps? Who's been stung by a wasp? Holy crap. That's like the worst thing ever. Yeah, ants can go eat all those stupid wasps. <laughs> they suck. <laughs> okay. And then, you know, I'm just listing some other examples of a specialist, too. Oh, here's a predator prey. Oh, yes. Go ahead. Do wasps serve a specific purpose besides just to torture people? Uh, so and that's a great question. So you can think of any sort of pest as why the, do, yeah, so everybody has their own little uh, niche. And so wasps can also act as pollinators. They're not as good as the honeybees and so forth. And then they also are food sources for um, birds and stuff. And their larvae is actually a better food source than, than actually when they grow up. Right? Same with mosquitoes. You're like, why the hell does a mosquito exist? That's rude. Okay? <laughs> but it's a huge food source for lots of birds and actually bats. Right? So if you're camping any place you know, where there's water, like up in the Sierras, right, you'll see the mosquitoes come out at dusk and just bats come out of hell. <laughs> like a bat out of hell. They just come out of everywhere and they can eat thousands of mosquitoes a night. So that's like a main food source for a bat. So, are, so, and mosquitoes are a predator, or actually more like a parasite, of other animals, right? And they are a vector for disease, which is good for those diseases, right? To, for their life, you know, their life cycle, the viruses, right, the parasitic worms that are passed through mosquitoes. Things on Earth don't exist to make people happy, right? They, they have evolved in their own little niche, and they serve whatever that purpose is, whether it's good or bad, right? The evolution doesn't try to make things perfect. It just, if you're good at whatever you do, you survive to reproduce. And if you don't, then you're dead. Okay, so here's another example of predator-prey interactions I think you'll like. The scorpion's venom could kill the shrew. But the shrew has lightning reflexes, and hunger makes it bold. out the enemy with all its tingling senses. But the shrew bobs and weaves just out of reach until finally the shrew turns a scorpion into dinner. So that's that little shrew guy who eats insects, even though uh, scorpions are an arachnid, which is in the spider family. They're not technically insects, even though we all kind of think of them as insects. That guy's not messing around. Okay, let's, let's watch another one. This is the honey badger. Watch it run in slow motion. 
It's pretty badass. Look, it runs all over the place. Whoa, watch out, says that bird. Ew, it's got a snake. Oh, it's chasing a jackal. Oh my gosh. Oh, the honey badgers are just crazy. The honey badger has been referred to by the Guinness Book of World Records as the most fearless animal in all of the animal kingdom. It really doesn't give a shit. If it's hungry, it's hungry. Ew, what's that in its mouth? Oh, it's got a cobra. Oh, it runs backwards. Now watch this. Look, a snake's up in the tree. Honey badger don't care. Honey badger don't give a shit. It just takes what it wants. Whenever it's hungry, it just, ew, and it eats snakes. Oh my god, watch it dig. Look at that digging. The honey badger is really pretty badass. They have no regard for any other animal whatsoever. Look, and it's just grunting and, ew, eating snakes. Ew, what's that, a mouse? Oh, that's nasty. Oh, they're so nasty. Ooh, look, it's chasing things and eating them. The honey badgers have a fairly long body, but a distinctly thick set, broad shoulders, and, you know, their, their skin is loose, allowing them to move about freely, and they twist around. Now look, here's a house full of bees. You think the honey badger cares? It doesn't give a shit. It goes right into the house of bees to get some larva. How disgusting is that? It eats larva. Ew, that's so nasty. But look. The honey badger doesn't care. It's getting stung like a thousand times. It doesn't give a shit. It just, it's hungry. It doesn't care about being stung by bees. Nothing can stop the honey badger when it's hungry. Oh, what a crazy fuck. Look. Ew, it's eating larva. That's disgusting. There it is, running in slow motion again. See? Now, what's interesting is that other, other animals, like these birds here, they just like to wait around until the honey badger's done eating, and then it swoops in to pick up the scraps. It says, you do all the work for us, honey badger, and we'll just eat whatever you find. How's that? What do you say, stupid? Look at this bird. Thanks for the treat, stupid. Hey, come back here, says the honey badger. Birds don't care. And you know what? The jackals do it, too. Look at these little dogs. They're like, thanks, stupid. Thanks for the mouse. See you later. The honey badger does all the work while these other animals just pick up the scraps. At nighttime, the honey badger goes hunting because it's hungry. Look. Here comes a fierce battle between a king cobra and a honey badger. I wonder what'll happen. Look at this. There's the honey badger just eating a mouse. And then look. Get away from me, says the snake. Get away from me. Honey badger don't care. Honey badger smacks the shit out of it. The snake comes back and it lashes right at the honey badger. Oh, little does the honey badger know, FYI, it's been stung. It's been bitten by the snake. So while it's eating the snake, ew, that's disgusting. Meanwhile, the poisonous venom is seeping through the honey badger's body, and it passes out. Look at that sleepy fuck. Now, the honey badger is just going to pass out for a few minutes, and then it's going to get right back up and start eating all over again, because it's a hungry little bastard. Look at this. Like nothing happened. The honey badger gets right back up and continues eating the cobra. How disgusting. And of course, what does the honey badger have to eat for the next three weeks? Cobra. The honey badger. Oh, yes. Uh-oh. What is this? Crazy fool. <laughs> yeah. All right, top hat time. Ee, ee, ee. Okay. <laughs> I know, it's a decision. I don't know, this is just an opinion question. <laughs> Look at you guys making decisions today. It's like the fastest question ever. <laughs> I think, well. <laughs> Are the textures in? No, not yet? Okay, sorry, no, it's a delay. <laughs> this one's so nasty. Are we in? No! <laughs> I 
catch a side. All right, where do they shoot? Oh, both are right. <laughs> right? Okay, if anybody puts C or D, I'm going to have to smack them. <laughs> what did we do? Oh, everybody likes the honey badger. Nice. He is pretty badass. It's been stung. Is everybody in? No? I think I can do this. It's still enabled. You're good. Oh, there we go. Yeah, you can pick the shrew. It's okay. They're both right. All right, I'll leave that one open. That way we can get all our answers in. Oh, goodness. All right, so that's predation. I don't think you guys will forget that. Okay, and then parasitism is when one of the individuals is benefited and the other is harmed but not necessarily killed, or at least not killed immediately. So one benefits and the other is harmed. The parasite generally lives with the host. So the host is whoever the parasite's living off of. Okay, so if it's a tick attached to your dog, the parasite is the tick and your dog would be the host. Right, it's not killing your dog, but if your dog had enough ticks on it, or like that poor moose with all those ticks and it's sucking all their blood, then they become anemic and it harms the animal. At some point, the parasite might kill the individual, but it's not like a predator where they kill it and eat it immediately. Okay, the parasite usually lives off of the host for some amount of time and sometimes never kills it and sometimes eventually does. Right, so like a tapeworm, right, if your cat gets a tapeworm, generally won't kill the cat as long as it has adequate food, but definitely does absorb lots of nutrients from the cat from its intestine, right? So the tapeworm lives in the intestine and it absorbs a bunch of the food that the cat eats, so your cat's always hungry, you have to feed it more, right? Or the cat will lose weight, okay? So if you really wanna lose weight, you could just lick a cat's butt and get a tapeworm. <laughs> yeah, I don't wanna lose weight that badly. Okay. And so, of course, we have another video. Let's watch this. Ticks are ectoparasites on vertebrates. Aww. They pierce the skin of their host with their mouth parts and gorge themselves on the host's blood. Ticks are a concern to humans because they transmit more disease than any other arthropod. Mites tend to be much smaller than ticks. Their small size allows them to move easily among the hairs or feathers of their host. They feed on skin cells and can cause dermal irritations. Ew, that's nasty. Yeah, so you're good with parasites, right? Worms, ticks, anything that harms you but doesn't kill you immediately, right? So again, the questions will be a setup of somebody, you know, goes out and devour, eats completely some other organism, that would be predation, right? Or uh, infects its host and slowly kills it over a course of six months or six years, that would be a parasite, okay? <coughs> and then other relationships amongst uh, species or organisms out there, something called mutualism, which is where both are actually benefited from the situation, right? So it's actually good for both parties. And so uh, an, an example would be a mutualistic bacteria and the bee, that's the example from our book, right? Uh, the bacteria lives in the bee's gut and helps uh, protect the bee from certain pathogens, right? And the bee in turn gives the bacteria a safe place to live. Right. We have lots of bacteria that live in our intestine. Yeah, clean up your butt. A whole lot of bacteria in there. Not bad for us, actually good for us. Helps us digest fiber, helps us digest some more plant material than we could without it. Gives us more nutrients. We provided a nice safe place to live and food. Okay, so that would be a mutualistic relationship. You could think of it even as, um, you know, they show the rhino with those birds that 
the bird pecks off all the little parasites on the rhino's back, and the, the rhino provides safety for that bird from predators. There's not a lot of predators that are going to come after a bird riding on a rhinoceros's back. Okay, that would be a mutualistic relationship, good for both. Right? Now, if the, now, if it's something riding around on the rhino that harmed the rhino, it would be a parasite. Right? But if it's, if, if it's good for both parties, then it's a mutualistic type relationship. Okay. <coughs> and then a commensalism or a commensal type relationship is one is benefited and the other doesn't give a crap. Right? Doesn't hurt them, doesn't help them, it's just neutral. Okay, but one gets a benefit. So you can think of that, you know, their little example would be the, a beehive in a dead tree, right? That doesn't harm the tree at all, but it provide, the tree provides support in some place for the bees to make their nest. Right? You think of it like a bird nest in a tree, right? The birds collect dead sticks on the ground and all kinds of little fuzzy stuff, puts it in a tree, does not harm the tree at all, but is a huge benefit to the bird because it's up high, and the dogs and all the coyotes can't get to their nest easily. Okay, so that'd be a commensal type relationship. Okay, and so those are the kinds of setups that you'll get for the exam. Some sort of, you know, this organism is doing blah, and this organism is doing blah. This one's helped, and this one's harmed. What is that? You know, and then you'll have the five options, and you got to pick the right answer. Okay, so if you know the definitions. The questions are easy. If you don't know the definitions, then the questions are hard. <laughs> okay, so make sure you know the definitions of all of these guys. Make note cards, make flashcards, quiz yourself, read aloud, watch lecture capture a billion times. <laughs> yeah, okay. However, it helps you draw little pictures of bacteria up somebody's butt. I don't know. <laughs> smiling, ah, the person's smiling, the bacteria is smiling, everybody's happy. It's mutualism. Okay. <clears throat> and then I think, I think, one of the last things we're going to talk about is the idea of mimicry out in nature. And so <sighs> mimicry happens, it's an interaction between different organisms, usually as protection for one species by looking like something else. So to mimic somebody is to copy them, right? It's like when your little brother or sister repeats everything you say, you know, stop talking, stop talking, shut up, shut up. I'm not talking to you, I'm not talking to you. And then they start fist fighting. Yeah, that's what happens at my house. <laughs> okay, same idea. The monarch, monarch butterflies are poisonous. Okay, so birds don't eat them once they realize that monarchs are poisonous. Okay, they're poisonous because their caterpillars eat from the milkweed, which uh, gives off a toxin to keep caterpillars from eating it. So plant defenses against predation or against grazing or whatever is to make something that tastes yucky or is toxic. The monarch caterpillar has evolved to be tolerant to this toxin. That toxin will kill all other types of butterfly caterpillars, but not the monarch. The monarch caterpillar is somehow able to absorb the toxin and keep it in its cells, like in little packages, in little vesicles. Okay? So that toxin stays in the caterpillar, it goes through metamorphosis, it becomes this beautiful butterfly, and those toxins are in all the cells of this butterfly. So if a bird comes flying along and grabs a monarch and tries to eat it, it tastes nasty and it's all horrible, and the bird spits it out, doesn't want to do that again. Okay. Another species of butterfly called the vice viceroy, viceroy is not poisonous. This is kind of a crappy picture of it. And it doesn't look exactly like the monarch, but it's pretty darn close, right? It's orange, it's got the spots. It's not poisonous at all. But birds will avoid it if they've ever tasted a monarch because it looks just like a monarch. They're not going to eat this one either. So this one avoids predation by looking like something poisonous without having to evolve to be able to you know, absorb toxins and eat different things and so forth. Right? 
And that likely happened because this species probably was randomly somewhat similar, orange and black and white or something like that. And randomly, the ones that had more of the spots or were a little more similar to this survived and reproduced, which means their offspring had the orange and black and white. And then those that looked even more like monarchs were the ones that didn't get eaten, survived to reproduce, and blah, 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 blah. Anything that didn't look similar to a monarch was munched and was dead, did not pass on those traits. Okay. So at some point, the variation in this population had to have some of these similarities, allowed them a little bit of protection, enough to get allele frequencies to change over time in that population, and then that's what evolved. And now, right, as long as there's enough monarchs around that birds learn that these are the nasty guys, then that guy will be offered some protection. Yeah. That's a great, uh, would that be, hmm. They don't, her question is, would that be convergent evolution? They don't call it convergent evolution because it's not adapting to the same environment for the same reasons. They actually consider it evolution by mimicry. Like, so they actually call it that because it specifically evolved that way to look just like this one. Not to survive and reproduce as far as like in the environment getting food or water or so forth. Like you think about the cactus and that euphorb, right? But specifically to look like this guy to afford it that reproductive advantage. So this would be specifically evolution by mimicry. Okay. So there's snakes out there. I don't even know which ones the, that look very similar. King snake and coral snake or something in red and black. You're on your back or something like that. Red touches black. or So one is not poisonous, one is poisonous. But predators avoid both because they look so similar. Okay, that would be mimicry. And that doesn't really do anything for this one. But the mimic, the one that looks like it, is the one that's afforded a reproductive advantage or survival advantage because it evolved to look just like something that is poisonous. And density dependent just means there has to be enough of the monarchs around for the birds to do the experiment. Because as it turns out, birds don't talk, right? And so when the mama bird has babies, she can't tell him, don't eat the monarchs. If it's orange and black, stay away. They kind of have to learn for themselves, right? So they're out, oh, there's a butterfly. Eat the purple one. Yummy, that's good. I can keep eating purple ones. Oh, I eat an orange and black one. <coughs> okay, avoid orange and black. Right. But if there's lots more of the mimic around and not the, they'll eat the orange and black and it'll be yummy. Right. So they'll maybe keep eating those till they run into a monarch and then they go, ah, some orange and black suck. I'm, I'm out. Right. So if there's more of the monarchs than the mimic, it works much better. So that's the whole density dependent. There has to be lots of the guy that's bad to help the, the faker, essentially. Right. The mimic is just a big fake. Okay. So this is just, right, he's going to try, why? Puked! <laughs> okay. Oh my god, there's more. Oh, we still have 10 minutes. Okay, I couldn't remember what's all in this lecture. Just keep talking. <laughs> uh, yes, so besides species on species action, <laughs> We also have human on species action, which in the most part, the competition with human beings comes all down to habitat space, right? Habitat destruction, um, as far as we are not leaving enough space for, um, oh shit, what is this? Oh, for, what's next? Oh my god, what, is that it? Oh, well, what the hell am I talking about? Oh my God, Becky. Okay, I, whatever. We'll just do this then. Right, people suck and we're just killing everything. How's that? <laughs> uh, so this is just from the book talking about all the things we're doing that's bad to stress the bees and this whole colony collapse where entire colonies of bees are dying, which is why we brought in all these other types of bees to try to hybridize our European bees to give them more hybrid vigor 
right? And even trying to encourage honeybees and the Native American bees that um, seem to be resistant to some of these fungal diseases and viral diseases, even though they're not great at poll pollinating, right? Trying to get them to be uh, more active in pollinating. So, yay, but so. The keystone species of the bee, right, could just, it could be a total disaster. And then we're going to all starve and we'll just be dead. How's that for an uplifting end of the lecture? We're going to ask you some top hands. Are you afraid of me? You are just disgusted by my presence. Oh, I don't know. Could be either of those. Oh, everybody's done with this one? Let's do some interactions. Oh, look at that. Hmm, what do you think? A small nematode roundworm infects a crop infesting beetle, causing the host beetle to produce fewer eggs. This interaction is an example of A, interference competition, B, predation, C, exploitative competition, D, parasitism. So if I give you some hints, the key word, besides just the setup, is the word host. The host beetle. Hmm. What could she be implying by that? I don't know. Hmm. Oh my god, you guys are firing in your answers today. You guys must have had a cappuccino before you came. I need a cappuccino. All right, well, people are finishing texting their little answers. Who has questions? Come on, people. The exam is Tuesday. Don't forget your Scantron and a number two pencil and your thinking cap. Questions? Come on, people, work with me. Yes. The test will be from the notes. The supporting information in the book, examples and so forth are fair game. But any of the concepts or definitions in the book that were not in a slide, you're not responsible for. So focus on the notes. Use the book as a reference or for something else to do. Remember, there's the free resources link in Moodle to the book for self quizzes. A recent study just showed the best way to study is to quiz yourself, right? Because you could think you know the answers because you've been looking at it for so long and then you actually don't really know. Yes, sir. Uh, you can use that one, but you don't have to. You, oh. Actually, it's the green one. Yeah. I've never seen this one. Yeah. The, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, it's just a little green guy. I don't even know what number it is. Nothing new from the book. Yeah, like this. So this, thank you, let me see. This is the Scantron you guys need, the regular little green guy. If you bring extras, you might be able to sell them that day for those people who forgot to make some money. The only stuff in the book that supports what we did in the notes. So like extra examples, ex elaborating, but nothing new from the book that's not covered in here. All right, people, have a good weekend.